News of the Times, History News Story. In today's episode, we turn our attention to 1899 and the famous Louise Massett case. In the papers, Louise Massett is also found under the name of Louisa Massett. Louise was, by all accounts, very beautiful, single, and had the responsibility of illegitimate baby to care. At the age of 36, she was not getting any younger. Within three weeks of her child's birth, a foster carer was sourced to take over the raising of her child for a monthly paid fee. Then, the body of a -a three-and-a-half-year-old boy was found in the woman's bathroom of London Bridge train station naked except for a black shawl, and horribly beaten about the face and head. In the press, the case was referred to as the Dalston Murder. We hope you enjoy the show. About Louise. Louisa Josephine Jemima Massett was half French on her father's side and half English from her mother. She was regarded as quite a beauty and a woman of culture and breeding with a taste for the finer things in life. On the 24th of April, 1896, she gave birth to her illegitimate son, whom she named Manfred. The scandal of French polite society was so extreme, Louise was forced to flee to England with her infant in tow. Louise settled in Newington, a rather respectable part of London, lodging with her sister. She rather quickly outsourced a foster carer in the form of the aptly named Mrs. Gentle. Mrs. Gentle was paid 37 shillings a month to care for Manfred. That was worth approximately £63 a month in 2023. It was reported that this sum of money came from the father in France. With the freedom this gave her, Louise supported herself with piano lessons and also worked as a day French governess for a wealthy family. It was reported that she would visit Manfred once a fortnight. The son. Louise's son Manfred, at the time of the murder, was three and a half years of age and had lived with Mrs. Gentle since he was three weeks old. He was reported as a normal, quite healthy and well cared for, strong, blonde boy. His attachment to Mrs. Gentle was noted. Reportedly, Louise would come for a visit once a fortnight to see Manfred. Mrs. Gentle confirmed that she felt that Louise was a good mother, and that Manfred wanted for nothing. Mrs. Gentle, Manfred's foster carer, received a letter on the 16th of October informing her that Manfred would be moving to France, as the father wished Manfred to learn the French language. Manfred was three and a half years old. Louise explained in the letter that she would collect Manfred on Friday, October 27, and would take Manfred to France herself. The Lover At this time, Louise, at the age of 37, had begun an intimate relationship with a 19-year-old Udor Lucas the previous year. Udor was also French and working in London, training in finance. As a trainee, Udor was only earning some three pounds a week, which would not be enough to support them both in the style that they wished. So any potential marriage was placed on hold, but it did appear it had been discussed. On the same Friday, when Louise was to collect Manfred from Mrs. Gentle, Louise and Udor had planned to travel to Brighton for a long weekend. They had booked adjoining rooms in a Brighton hotel, and their rail tickets had been paid for and collected. Setting the scene. Friday, October 27, 1899, 
Mrs. Gentle, as per instruction, went to Stamford Hill with little Manfred. She had packed his belongings, made a parcel of his clothes, and dressed Manfred in a blue dress, as was the custom at this time, and a sailor hat. Tearful goodbyes between the two ensued as Mrs. Gentle released Manfred into the care of his mother, Louise. Louise and Manfred took a bus to London Bridge Railway Station. Both Louise and Manfred were seen in the first-class waiting room at the railway station, where Manfred seemed upset, which was noted by the attendant there. Louise and Manfred left the waiting room, and Louise reappeared some three hours later without Manfred to catch her train to Brighton for her rendezvous with Udor. The crime scene. The crime, by all accounts, was brutal. At Dalston Junction Station in the ladies' toilets, the body of a naked child was discovered. The naked young boy, wrapped vaguely in a black shawl, too small to cover the whole of him, had been brutally beaten about the face and head. Next to him were two pieces of broken clinker brick. It was a horrific scene. The police had very little information to go on until they were contracted by Mrs. Gentle, Manfred's former foster carer. From the Utoxeter New Era, on the 8th of November, 1899. The Dalston Case With regard to the Dalston case, some sensational stories were current on Monday to an alleged identification of the remains of the child by a woman who said that they were those of a little boy who she had nursed from infancy and who had taken from her on Friday afternoon last by his mother, a French lady who stated her intention of taking him to Paris. The woman was positive in her identification and was greatly affected when shown the body, but in view of the fact that she gave the age of the child to be three and a half years, whilst the murdered boy was at least six, there are to the sufficiency of the identification. The name and address of the woman was taken and inquiries being made, but so far as could be ascertained on Monday night, there was no direct evidence of identification, without which the case is likely to be numbered with so many other London mysteries. With regard to the tragedy, it should be mentioned that about half past six on Friday evening of last week, the diabolical murder was discovered to have been committed, presumably from the findings of the body there at Dalston Junction North London Railway. At the time named, the attention of one of the porters called by two young women to the ladies' waiting room on number three platform. The porter was informed by the woman that they thought someone was ill in the lavatory as they were unable to open the door to its full extent. The man at once proceeded to the spot and was then horrified to find the body of a little boy lying behind the door. It was covered over with a new woollen shawl, and on removing this it was discovered that the body was entirely nude. Superior officials were informed, and Dr. Fennell of Dalston Lane was at once called. A hasty examination proved at once that a most foul murder had been committed. The body was still warm, but the doctor was of the opinion that death had taken place at least two hours previously. There were several clean-cut wounds about the face and another small wound in the centre of the forehead from which the brain matter was protruding. It was at first thought that the injuries had been inflicted with a knife, but further examination proved that the child undoubtedly had been murdered with the aid of two pieces of clinker, both of which had sharp projections, which were lying beside the body. The murdered boy is a bright-looking little fellow between five and six years of age, with fair hair inclined to curls 
and of fair complexion. The murderess, for it is taken for granted that a woman had committed the crime, having regard to where the body was found, had taken care to remove all the clothing from the body. The shawl which was laid over the child is of a very common make of black wool and could have been purchased at any draper's. The police, however, will be glad to hear from any person who has recently sold one. The shawl being quite new, and they will also be pleased to hear from anyone who has either lost a child, which answers to the description of the deceased, or having seen a person having the custody of such a child. The body was taken to the Hackney Mortuary. An Important Arrest The mystery surrounding the discovery of the dead body of a little boy in the lavatory of the platform at Dalston Junction on the North London Railway has been partially solved and the mother of the innocent little victim is in the custody of the police charged with willful murder. So far as has been ascertained, the following are the main facts in the story of the alleged crime. The mother of the child is Louise Massett, she one of three daughters of a gentleman who is said to have been a wealthy city merchant. Her two sisters are married, one lives at Croydon and the other at 29 Bethune Road, Stoke Newington. With the latter Miss Massett, who it should be stated is single, resided. Some years ago, Miss Massett, then 27 years of age, was keeping company with a French gentleman who, it is alleged, deceived and affected a ruin. The little boy, whose death now forms the subject of the charge of murder, was born about April 1896, when three weeks old the child was put out to a nurse with a woman at Tottenham who from time to time received payment for his keep and his clothes. He, the boy, grew into a strong, healthy, fair-haired child, and his foster mother became greatly attached to him. Last week, Miss Massett is said to have told her relatives that the father of the child had determined to have the little fellow brought up and educated in France. The nurse at Tottenham was informed of this decision, and Miss Massett herself undertook the duty of transferring the child to his father. At noon on Friday of last week, the nurse parted regretfully with her charge, and she saw Miss Massett get into one of the omnibuses flying between the birdcage, Stamford Hill, and the Elephant and Castle. The little boy was then safe and well. There, for the present, the chain of evidence is broken. Late the same evening, Miss Massett is believed to have arrived at her sister's house at Croydon. At six o'clock, the shocking discovery was made at Dalston Junction. It was noted at the time that the head of the child was injured and that a piece of garden rockwork, clinkered brick, was on the floor. With this, the injury to the head had apparently been afflicted. The body was quite naked but covered with a shawl. The belief prevailed from the first time that the crime was committed in the lavatory and the theory arrived at as a result of the post-mortem examination that the child was stunned with a piece of rock work and then suffocated. The official result of the post-mortem has, however, not been allowed to transpire. The police were absolutely without any clue to work upon, and at first it seemed probable that the supposed murder would be added to a long list of undiscovered London mysteries. On Monday, however, a startling incident occurred which put the police at once on to the new scent. About noon, the nurse from Tottenham, more out of curiosity than anything else, went to the Hackney mortuary 
and positively identified the child. The poor woman was so shocked that she fainted on the spot. The nurse's story was soon told to the detectives and everyone concerned was enjoined to the strictest secrecy. The police proceeded to the house in Bethune Road, some idea of the character of which may be gathered when stated that its rateable value is probably £100 a year, and the inquiries soon gave strong confirmation to the nurse's story. Miss Massett was not to be found, and her friends were unable to give any clue as to her whereabouts. On Tuesday morning, the police reported the arrival of a gentleman at the house in Bethune Road. Detective Sergeant Bora and other officers were soon on the spot, and when this gentleman and another left the house, their footsteps were dogged until they entered the booking office at London Bridge Station. Directly the gentleman had taken tickets, one of the detectives stepped up to the window and said, Tickets for the same place. The booking clerk handed the officer two tickets for Croydon. While the pursuers and then pursued were waiting for the train, one of the gentlemen suddenly wheeled around and boldly confronted officers, said, Are you watching me? Quite true, replied one officer. We are, and we must follow you until we are satisfied. Then the gentleman is said to have told the officers that no trouble would be given, and Miss was at his house in Croydon. Thither the officers proceeded, and the young lady was arrested and conveyed to Dalston Police Station. The gentleman to whom the officers traced the London Bridge Station is the prisoner's brother-in-law. It is understood that the prisoner stoutly denies the committal of the alleged murder, and it is stated on her behalf that at proper time satisfactory evidence will be forthcoming which will throw the, an alternative light onto the mystery. The mother charged. At North London Police Court on Wednesday, Louise Massett, 32, governess of Stoke Newington, was remanded, charged with the murder of her illegitimate son, aged three and a half years, whose dead body was found in a lavatory at Dalston Junction Station, in circumstances indicating that death had been by suffocation. The prisoner's story is that she left the child at London Bridge Station in the charge of two women to whom she paid £12 to care for it. Mrs. Eleanor Gentle. The papers were filed with the horrific findings of the little boy's body. On Monday the 30th of October, Mrs. Gentle received a letter from Louise telling her that Manfred missed her and had been unwell during the ferry crossing, but was now fully recovered. Mrs. Gentle was sceptical. She had seen the news of the unknown boy's body at the train station and contacted the police. This led to her identifying Manfred's body as well as the packet of clothes she had gathered together for his trip to France. The information was reviewed at the inquest. From the Bristol Mercury, the 3rd of November, 1899. The Dalston Mystery. The Inquest of the murdered boy. Dr. Wynne Westcott, coroner, opened an inquiry at the Hackney Coroner's Court in London yesterday into the circumstances attending the death of Manfred Louise Massett, aged three and a half years, the illegitimate son of Louise Massett, described as a governess, of 29 Bethune Road, Stoke Newington. The mother now stands remanded from the North London Police Court on the capital charge. The accused woman was present in court in the custody of a warder and wardress from Holloway Jail. Mr. Arthur Newton, solicitor, appeared for the accused woman, who was perfectly composed at the outset, even after having viewed the body in the mortuary. 
Eleanor Gentle of Tottenham, a single woman, described herself as a nurse, repeated the evidence she gave at the police court on Wednesday. She added that during the, the time the child was under her care, the mother was good and kind to it. Mrs Gentle also said that she had never seen the putative father, but the mother used to call once a fortnight, but latterly had seen it once a week. The child wanted for nothing on the part of the mother, and the poor little fellow used to look forward to her weekly visit with great pleasure. On the 16th of October, witness received a letter from the mother saying that she had accidentally met the father who wanted the child to live with a cousin in order that he might learn the French language. The mother added that if she interfered with the father, it might injure the boy's prospects in life. Ultimately, it was arranged that Mrs. Gentle should meet Miss Massett at the Bird Cage Tavern on Stamford Hill on Friday last. Mrs. Gentle met the mother there at 12.45 p.m., and the boy was taken away by Miss Massett in a bus. The coroner. Did you ever see the boy alive again? The witness. No. Here the witness burst into tears. Next to give evidence was Mrs. Leone Kaditch of 29 Bethune Road, the wife of a commission merchant and sister of the accused woman. She stated that she identified the body of the boy whom she last saw alive in April on the anniversary of his birthday. The mother, Louise, who worked as a French governess, had lived with her sister for the last 18 months. The coroner. Why did she take the child away from the care of Miss Gentle? Witness. To put him in the custody of his father, she told me. The witness professed ignorance of the father or his cousin's address, but thought her sister was going to take the child to France to the cousin. The sister confirmed that Louise, the mother, returned home at 9pm on Sunday and she went to bed without making any statement. The sister is asked whether she had asked about the child she confirms that she did not, as the child had been a sore point within the family for some time. From the Taunton Courier and Western Advertiser, 15th of November, 1899. The Dalston Tragedy. Dr. Wynne Westcott on Thursday resumed the inquest on the child Manfred Massett, whose dead body was found at Dalston Junction Railway Station a fortnight ago. Miss Louise Massett, the boy's mother, who is in on a charge of willful murder, was present. Several witnesses were examined, their testimony related movements of the accused on the day following finding the body and to the discovery of a parcel containing the child's clothes. The police evidence disposed of any possibility of the accused woman having after the death of her boy, paid a visit to France. On the contrary, she was shown to have gone down to Brighton on the evening of the boy's death, and the day after met a gentleman friend, a young foreigner, who stayed at the same hotel with her on the Saturday and Sunday, and eventually the inquiry was adjourned for a week. The evidence against Louise was damning. Louise was the last person to have been seen with Manfred. The broken clinker brick was identified as being the same type that was found in the sister's garden where Louise lodged. Louise was known to be familiar with Dalston Junction Station as she used it regularly to go to one of her piano pupils. The shop where the black shawl that Manfred's body had been wrapped in was identified. The store assistant was able to recognise Louise as having purchased the shawl due to her, Louise's, distinct voice. In an identity lineup, Louise was identified 
by the waiting room assistant, who had seen both Louise and an upset Manfred together a few hours before the discovery of his body. The trial. The trial took place for five days in December 1899, at the Old Bailey before Justice Bruce. With the wealth of evidence against her, the prosecution case was strong. Louise's defence, such as it was, was that she had handed Manfred over to two women with an initial deposit of £12 to look after him as his new carers, and they must have killed Manfred. No receipt could be produced confirming the transaction, and the mysterious two women could not be found. The jury did not believe her. She was found guilty. From the Dundee Advertiser, 19th of December, 1899, the sentence of death. The trial concluded at Old Bailey, London, yesterday evening of Louise Massett, French governess, on a charge of murdering her illegitimate son, aged three and a half years, at Dalston Junction Station. After deliberating for half an hour, the jury found the prisoner guilty. When asked if she had anything to say, she replied, I'm quite innocent of the charge. Justice Bruce then passed sentence of death. The execution. A request for a reprieve was forwarded to the Home Secretary, but flatly declined. From the Sheffield Independent on the 25th of December 1899, the condemned woman, Louise Massett. Petition for reprieve. A petition is in course of preparation to the Home Secretary praying for the reprieve of the condemned woman, Louise Josephine Massett, now under sentence of death in Newgate for the murder of her illegitimate son at Dalston. Miss Massett is bearing up remarkably well. The execution is fixed for January the 9th. Louise spent Christmas and New Year in the cells in Newgate Prison, with a constant watch of female warders to ensure she did not harm herself. Her executioner was James Billington. Louise was hanged at Newgate Prison on the 9th of January 1900 for the brutal murder of her three-and-a-half-year-old son. From the Hampshire Advertiser, the 10th of January, 1900. The Execution of Louise Massett. Confession of the Crime. Louise Josephine Massett, 36, a French governess, was executed at Newgate on Tuesday morning for the murder of her illegitimate child, Manfred Massett, aged three and a half years. The crime was of a peculiarly cold-blooded nature. The child had been reared by a woman who received regular payments from Miss Massett through the father, a Frenchman. Miss Massett was herself half French. She regularly visited the child, but on October the 27th took him from his foster mother, ostensibly to send him back to France. By desire of the father... But at Dalston Station it was proven she went into the lady's lavatory and there strangled the child, leaving the body in a nude state, covered only with a shawl. The motive of the crime was supposed to be the fact that Miss Mattet was courting a young Englishman and wished to be relieved of the encumbrance of the child. Mrs. Dyer, the notorious Reading baby farmer, was the last woman executed at Newgate. Notwithstanding the heavy mist that enveloped the city, a crowd commenced to collect outside the prison walls before seven o'clock. By eight o'clock it had swelled to considerable dimensions, and when, at a quarter to nine, the prison bell began to toll between two and three thousand persons, must have been present. The foreign element was conspicuous by its almost entire absence, although it was reported that a female relative of the condemned woman 
was amongst the crowd. Not more than a few seconds had elapsed after the hour of nine had struck when the black flag was run up from the quadrangle announcing to the world that Louise Massett had met her doom. The appearance of the flag was greeted with loud cheering, but the crowd, which was a most orderly one, at once quickly dispersed. The execution was carried out by Billington, assisted by his son. Since Sunday, when the Home Secretary's final decision was communicated to her, the wretched woman had remained in a most despondent and dejected state of mind. She retired to her bed shortly after ten on Monday night, but she was very reckless and had little sleep. She rose at six o'clock on Tuesday. The condemned woman looked nervous and haggard, but did not show the slightest symptoms of fear at her approaching end. She scarcely touched her breakfast, which consisted of bread and butter and tea. The Reverend Mr. Ramsay, the prison chaplain, was with her to the last. The process of pinioning was carried out without the slightest resistance, and to the relief of all, she confessed to the crime, her last words being, What I am about to suffer is just, and now my conscience is clear. She walked to the scaffold without assistance, and death appeared to be instantaneous. An inquest was subsequently held on the body, and the usual verdict was returned. The governor of the jail informed the coroner that the deceased said to the chaplain, What am I going to suffer is just. The features of the woman presented a placid appearance, and beyond the mark of the rope around the neck, there was no indication that she had met with a violent death. And so ended the life of Louise Massett, the first person to be executed in Britain in the new century. That concludes history news story of the Louise Massett case. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please do subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We are aiming for 1,000 subscribers. If you have already subscribed, our sincere thanks for your support. We very much appreciate it. We upload five times a week. Please note, we have changed our schedule. We are sorry for any confusion or inconvenience, but it was necessary. Saturdays are our serial killer Saturdays, and we review one of the historical serial killers in our large database. Sundays is a new series we are trialling Eccentric Sundays, where we look into Great Britain's rich history of quirky, odd and eccentric characters. Mondays, an in-depth investigation into a famous story of its day. Tuesdays, we present a pooled together collection of stories from our database, for example, Murders on Railways. And on Wednesdays, Whitechapel Wednesdays, where we chronologically go through the newspaper stories related in Whitechapel, leading to the series of gruesome crimes of 1888 and arguably beyond. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.